Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Uh, no, I am not Douglas Rushkoff, but if you squint really hard, or if you're on 6th Street last night, then I guess you can't tell the difference. Unfortunately, Douglas did have a family medical emergency, but he will be joining us today via Skype to share his Team Human manifesto. But if you're here just for the selfie, or you were just hoping to breathe the same air as one of the original cyberpunks, then I guess you can leave now. We apologize. But if you're here to learn what it might mean to remake society towards human ends rather than the ends of humans, then I guess you're in the right place. And let me be the first to welcome you to Team Human. It's in this room where you will find the others and all of those who uh, rushed out the door. And I actually noticed nobody did rush out the door. So that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. You are, uh, you're in the right place. And I guess now we're going to have a little bit of fun and all of us together will get to join the conspiracy. So my name is Luke Robert Mason, I am the director of Virtual Futures, and today I am the fleshly avatar for my friend and mentor, Douglas Rushkoff. The aim of my organization is to bury the 20th century to begin work on the 21st. So, in that vein, let's begin. I've been giving a lot of thought lately to the types of audiences who turn up to events like this. What's more, I've been thinking about the sorts of rare sorts of people who invest in the badge and are actually committed to attending the sessions and perhaps might be mad enough to go see some of the actual South by Southwest content. Amongst the activations, the brand building, and the plethora of parties, we forget the purpose of events like this. It's so that we can be exposed to new ideas and, more importantly, to find the others. The content, after all, is sometimes just an excuse to be breathing together as we are right now in this room. And in an age where every talk is readily available on demand on YouTube, why sit physically in this room? Well, it's because we know that there is something special and something ephemeral and something unexplainable about those moments when we come together, not as conference attendees, but as humans. So then why are you in this room? And I gave that a little thought too. And the more and more I think about it, the more and more I keep coming back to this idea of escapism. Escapism from an increasingly perplexing present. One that we feel is so fundamentally flawed that we can't help but fantasize together about the alternative. The problem is that since the turn of the 21st century, humanity's self-esteem is at an all-time low. And these fantasies have rather quickly become almost uh, masochistic. So we engage in futurism as a form of fantasy, as a form of daydreaming, as a form of escapism. And the sorts of futures that we imagine create a kind of potentiality that might actually be fulfilled in the actual, might be fulfilled and might come to pass at places like this. And when we imagine futures, well, these futures, they're not, they're not material, they're ideas, but they are real. They are abstract possibles, abstract possibilities, something that can be imagined and yet has not yet come to pass. This sort of futurism matters because when a successful idea has enough libidinal power injected into it, it is able to enter the arena of culture where it might become a hyperstition or hyper superstition. These hyperstitions are more powerful than memes and have the ability to influence the entirety of culture and influence perhaps a cultural evolution. So what do I mean by that? Well, in other words, be careful what you wish for. 
Be careful what you prophesize because it might actually come to pass. The best example of something that we have conjured into being is capitalism, which now that it has been downloaded into culture has casually brought about its own reality. In fact, this reality has been so baked in by the positive feedback cycles that it has now, in the words of Frederick Jameson, become easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. As such, we are really good at imagining the end of the world. Maybe it's AI gone astray, an asteroid on collision course with Earth, nuclear error, some form of bioterrorism, a suicide epidemic, or the inevitability of climate crisis. But there's still hope. Don't worry. There is still hope. When it comes to imagining the end of capitalism, there are still a few thinkers out there who are brave enough to stand up and not accept humanity's inevitable end. One of those thinkers is Douglas Rushkoff. And if free market capitalism is our dominant hyperstition or operating system, as Douglas would call it, then how do we course correct? How do we generate a new hyperstition? One that again allows us to influence our collective cultural evolution. And how do we tackle this weird little self-esteem crisis that humanity currently faces? Well, this is what Douglas's book, Team Human, attempts to answer. And the more time I spend with it, the more time I realize that it is not just an assemblage of pages. It might actually be our first line of defense against our collective destruction. It might actually ensure our collective survival. So please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Live from New York, Douglas Rushkoff. Hi, I am deeply sorry I can't be there. I have a family member who got rushed into an emergency surgery, and it's interesting, I was in this uh, quandary of like, do I just leave them in the hospital and go? Because this is my South by Southwest talk, or, or do I be there for them? And if it were any other book, I might have come, but it seemed it seemed kind of uh, hypocritical to be arguing for human connection and how we have to remember who we are and our families and our loved ones and our real world, and and then hop on a plane to uh, to you know pitch a book or even to pitch uh, a set of ideas. Um, so while I'm I'm truly sorry I can't be there and deeply honored that that you're in the room anyway, um, and we will we will get to interact some. Um, it's also a great opportunity to see what tech does and doesn't do. I mean, in this case, uh, technology is compensating for the fact that I've got a family member in the hospital. You know, it's it's like a drug when you're sick. That technology, whether it's our glasses or our antibiotics or our computers here compensating for uh, uh, my family member being sick, they, they help us uh, get as close to normal as we can. And... I've started actually to think about almost every technology as a drug. You know, in some cases we can use them because we're, we're sick or we're compensating for something, but what about when we're using them just the way we use drugs? You know, every tech, every medium is a drug. You're, you're on Facebook, you're on the internet, but you're also uh, on English. You know, when you go to a, uh, a monastery and you see someone who's on a, uh, a vow of silence for 30 days, they're not on a vow of silence because they're trying to get rid of their ego. It's because they understand that language itself, the English language, is software, that your mind on English is different than your mind not on English. And certainly, uh, the internet and digital technology is a drug or like a drug. It's, it's why acid heads were hired to write the operating systems at, at Intel and Microsoft and Apple back in the late 80s and early 90s. It was really only psychedelics users and kids who felt comfortable uh, creating the hallucinations that we would all live by. 
It's why technology happened in places like San Francisco and what, uh, at least what used to be, what used to be Austin and what used to be San Francisco. I mean, it is kind of funny. Now, when we go to when we go to these towns, it's as if uh, those of us who aren't there are kind of bringing some of that original kind of spiritual ethos to these places that are now just you know kind of hyper capitalist digital uh, uh, digital development places. But it was uh, it was Timothy Leary who said that the internet was acid. He said the internet's as, as strong as acid, and was so psyched that people would be able to take that kind of acid without actually uh, bringing a chemical into themselves. But if he was right, and the internet is like acid, that here we are 25, 30 years later, having completely ignored the set and setting with which we were going to take that drug, and now America and the world is kind of having this one big bad trip. You know, it's as if in the early days of the internet, uh, Mondo 2000, and Wired Magazine were kind of in a, a, a battle of sorts for who was going to get to frame the internet, who was going to establish the set and the setting for this, for this medium. And it feels as if, you know, the Wired, the, the Wired idea of the internet being a way to save the NASDAQ stock exchange kind of won out over the more Mondo 2000 reality hacker original San Francisco dream of the internet being a way that we were going to kind of experiment with hardwiring the collective imagination and, and seeing what kind of a great uh, uh, social, political, economic rave we could create. And I've looked back hard on how those decisions were made historically. And I don't think it's just a story of big, bad businesses coming in and taking away our little net from us. Because th those of us who were involved, especially the hackers and developers who were involved in the late 80s and early 90s, then you have to remember, our, our parents thought the fact that we were getting involved in computers was us throwing away our careers. If you told your parents you were going to get involved in uh, you know, developing computers or UX, UI, it was as if you were telling them that you were going to do Dungeons and Dragons professionally. You know, they thought you had been lost because there was no business online. There were no jobs. AT&T turned down the internet. Everybody saw the internet as this drag on traditional media, on traditional business. So once, you know, a few companies were coming in and saying, oh, I'll give you money for that dot-com idea. We'll, we'll support this little project, this little game you want to do. It was as if you know, our parents were acknowledging that what we were doing was real, that as if it, as if it mattered. So it, it wasn't just like they were bad and taking this thing away. It was, it was a sense of acknowledgement from, from the top that we were doing something that, that might someday matter. You know, I was I was one of those people who, who my first book on the internet. It was called Siberia. It got canceled in 1992 because the publisher thought the internet would be over by 1993 when the book was supposed to come out. Right? They thought it was like CB radio, this this fad. So, for those of us, you know, in San Francisco and in Austin and all the places where these technologies were developing, it it's no wonder that we accepted the acknowledgement. But of course, what happened once Wired Magazine and the, the, the business community was allowed to frame the net, they said that this was a long boom. I don't know if you remember that Wired cover and that great book called The Long Boom. It came out in around 96, I guess. And what their thesis was, was that thanks to the internet, the economy would now grow exponentially in an accelerating fashion forever. That was the line, that the economy would now be able to grow forever and accelerate. And even Alan Greenspan, the head of the chairman of the Federal Reserve, said, yeah, I guess this is the new paradigm, that now we're going to be an infinite, perfect, uh, 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 infinite growth. And what we saw as the story changed, as the internet went from the culture pages to the business pages, that, well, gosh, even South by Southwest went from being this kind of Burning Man-like countercultural reaction to, <clears throat> to the digital industry, and it became more like a cultural backdrop 
for VC, like this setting, the same as San Francisco is kind of this Disney-esque backdrop for Google and Facebook, but it's not San Francisco. People from San Francisco can't afford to live there anymore. And, and to answer the need, the, the, the mandate for infinite growth, the internet ethos really changed from what can we do for people to, and I hear this still in meetings, how do we get people to blank? How do we get people to join this? How do we get people on this thing? And really what we were, what we were originally going for, which was increased novelty and strangeness and anomalous behavior, became a quest for predictability. Right? Because the internet became less about infinite possibility than about betting on something. Where am I going to invest my money and how do I make that outcome more and more certain? So we ended up really, instead of creating technologies for people to use, we created technologies that use people. We use technology on people. You, you have a smartphone. Every time you swipe on your smartphone, you get dumber about it and it gets smarter about you. Right? And if you even want to get smart about your smartphone and you open it up, it's all closed proprietary black box algorithms. You're not even allowed to know what it's doing. And we know what it's doing. I mean, you can't see the, you can't see the routines themselves, but we know that, that what the, the, the smartphone industry does and the social media industry does now is basically port the algorithms from Las Vegas slot machines into our devices in order to addict us. You can go to Stanford and take classes in captology with BJ Fogg, where you learn things like how to, how to put streaks on things to get kids to come back every day. And you can go to Facebook. And really, what's Facebook for? Facebook is there to help you know, use someone's data that they leave behind them in order to put them in a statistical bucket and then predict with about, as we know now, 80% accuracy that person's future behavior. So they can figure out from our past data with about 80% accuracy if we're gonna go on a diet or get, diver get divorced or get fertility treatments or, or change gender. But then what do they do once they have that 80% figure? Well, then your newsfeed will start to get filled with stuff. If it was a diet they figured out you were gonna go on or had 80% chance of going on, your newsfeed's gonna start to have, oh, uh, are you feeling a little fat today? Or look at this story about what happens inside your veins when you eat the wrong kinds of food. Now, they're not just trying to sell you a particular company's diet routines or health reg regimen. What they're trying to do is to get that 80% accuracy up to 90% or 95%, because it's that 20% of people who were gonna do something else, who had some anomalous behavior, who had some novel choice or some original path, those are the enemy of predictability. So the object of the game is to try to reduce that unpredictable behavior and get 80% to 90%. But what happens when we reduce the 20%? That's the humanity that I'm concerned about here. That's the thing that we're getting rid of in order to mechanize our behavior and increase the predictability. So I've started to look at algorithms, I mean, not really superstitiously, but algorithms seem to me at this point to be the closest thing we have to demons. You know, we put something out on the internet, we teach it how to find our exploits. Remember when exploit was a hacker term for looking for an exploit in the system? Now we teach algorithms how to find human exploits and then leverage them in order to get us to do behaviors and to take actions that are against our better judgment and against our best interests. So what, what I'm writing about and what I'm, I'm trying to communicate, and I think it's the easiest way to think about this, is that we've had a profound reversal of figure and ground of, in this case, of, of, of people and machines, but you can you can see it throughout society. This is not just a digital phenomenon. I mean, uh, money, say, money was, uh, the good kinds of money were actually invented in the late Middle Ages. They were like poker chips that would expire at the end of the day. Money was invented to help people transact, to promote the transactions and, and really promote the velocity of currency and transactions between people. Well, what happened in the in the late Middle Ages, right before the Renaissance? The kings came along and they tweaked money so it would have the opposite purpose. Interest-bearing central currency was invented and all of the local currencies were, were made illegal. Now, what is interest-bearing currency for? 
the function of the money, the operating system of currency, is to extract value from people and places. That's why you have to pay it back at interest. And now, because it's a, a, a single operating system, we don't even know it's an operating system. We don't even remember that it's a choice. Or we look at, say, stocks. What were stocks originally for? Stocks were a way of capitalizing businesses. It was a way of investing in a business. Now what are stocks? It's reversed. Businesses are there to serve the stock, to serve the shareholders. And stocks have gotten reversed. Now remember stocks, people who wanted to get stocks, uh, uh, if you wanted to buy a stock 30 days or 30 months or whatever in advance, you'd buy this thing called a derivative. It's a derivative of the stock. So the derivatives are depending on the stock. But what's happened? Now derivatives trading outnumbers regular trading. The New York Stock Exchange, which actually it was purchased by its derivatives exchange. So now stocks are to derivatives like companies are to stocks or workers are to companies. Each figure ends up getting subsumed by its ground, by its, by its other thing. So what happens now is that in, in the digital technology is that humans, partly because we are running digital companies that have to grow by any means necessary, our human beings, our human users are not the users, but the used. And the companies themselves are not there to provide goods and services to people. They are there to serve the market. So all of these sweet young developers, they understand Unix or iOS, but they don't understand the underlying operating system of all their businesses, which is the operating system of capitalism. They just accept it as if it's a condition of nature. But what happens when we turn a, an application or a platform from something that's serving a human need to a way of extracting value or data from a person. Well, all of a sudden we start optimizing all of our apps, all of our, all of our platforms to induce in people the conditions, the states of mind, the set and the settings that allow them, that, that, that lead them to create more value for the app, which means clicking on things, paying more attention. So we atomize people and we frighten people because atomized, frightened people are easier to manipulate. Twitter or Instagram, they want us, it needs us to react in a, in a reptilian way when we see a kid wearing a MAGA hat facing off with a Native American, right? We're not supposed to uh, uh, respond with our frontal cortex and wonder, oh, I wonder what's happening there. Maybe I'll wait until a journalist actually goes there and tells me what's going on. No, that's going for the brainstem. Oh my God, look at that kid in the MAGA hat. I hate him. Oh, this is awful. Or if you're on the other side, oh, look at that, look at that horrible old Native American manipulating a nice little Catholic schoolboy. That's what the apps want. That's what the platforms want. It's not, I'm not saying that Zuckerberg or anybody, that they're mean people, that they, that they want to hurt us. It's they want to serve their masters, which is their, their shares, their shareholders. And the way they do that is by rendering a platform or by turning the platform over to the algorithms that are going to figure that out, whether we've programmed it or not. And what it's leading to is what we're all seeing is this deterioration of our society is a deeply anti-human bias, not just in the tech industry, but, but throughout our culture where we see human beings as the problem and technology as the solution, or at least technology as the escape. And that was, you know, that, that I did this TED talk about it, these, these billionaires who had hired me to, I thought to do a talk, but they actually, um, it was just five billionaires in a room that wanted to know if they were putting their bunkers in the right place, you know, New Zealand or Alaska, and, and what sort of uh, insulation should they have? Is it an electromagnetic pulse? Is it a, a human revolution? Is it climate change? What's the thing that's gonna come? And what's the highest, I mean, it was really, uh, it, was, it was sad for me that these guys who are I thought so rich and powerful, the supposedly most powerful people in the world are actually, they see the future as an inevitability, not as something they can change. That really the best they can do is earn enough money to insulate themselves from the reality that they're creating by earning money in that way, right? And that's 
<laughs> That's profoundly sad. You know, or if it's not them, then the, the other side, the optimistic side would be the transhumanists. And I'm sorry, you know, if there's transhumanists in the audience, God bless. It's a beautiful vision. But transhumanism of, of the sort that they're talking about is how do I upload my consciousness onto the computer before the bad thing happens, right? Before either my individual death or our collective death, before the end of society. It's this weird sort of escape. And I was on a panel years ago with one of the famous transhumanists who was arguing that uh, uh, evolution is really the process through which information migrates towards more and more complex hosts. So it moves from atoms to molecules to cells and organisms to humans to human culture. Now we developed computers, so the information should go to computers and human beings, once the singularity happens, we should just uh, recede, you know, uh, uh, humbly accept our own extinction as part of the evolutionary process. And I argued, no, you know, it's okay. There's a place for human beings. Human beings are wonderful and weird. You know, we, we can, we can uh, engage with paradox. We can sustain ambiguity over time. We don't need to collapse something to a one or a zero, but we can live in that weird liminal place between the two, that unresolved place. We can watch a David Lynch film, you know, and not understand what it means and still experience that as enjoyable. You know, what computer can do that? And until you can make one that does, you know, let's hang on. Let's let's create a place for humans in the digital future. And he said, oh, Rushkoff, you're just saying that because you're human, right? As if it was hubris to argue for a place for humans. And that's when I came up with this meme, the sort of team human. I said, okay, fine. You know, guilty is charged. I'm on team human. And I refuse to feel guilty for that. You know, I refuse to see human beings as the problem. You know, in some ways we are, are, you know, we're the perpetrator, but in another sense, we're the victim. You know, we are the victims of colonialism run amok. It's as if, you know, even white guys on the West Coast of America are now an indigenous species on this planet under attack from our own, uh, our own systems, our own operating systems and our own, uh, our, our own economy. And when I hear my peers who are looking to address it, you know, on the one hand, I'm really pleased. So I'll hear about, you know, the humane technology movement. And part of me goes, yay, here are the former guys, the ones who went to those captology classes with BJ Fogg, the ones who created all the addictive algorithms at the social media companies, you know, guys like McNamee and all. Now they're coming together and spending their money to figure out how to develop more humane technologies. But when I hear the term humane technology, I think about like the writing on a on the, the uh, pack of like uh, a, a cage free chicken, you know, that it was raised humanely all the way to the slaughter. So now we're going to at least let's try to treat those humans more humanely as we extract their data and take their money and do all that. And no, I, I don't like the orientation. It's not about how technology is treating the humans in its care. I want to change that dynamic. Again, we are the figure. We are not the ground. We are not the objects being acted upon by technology, but we are the users. And I think the path toward recognizing that is remembering that being human, and the story of evolution itself, being human is a team sport. You know, it's impossible to remember that under the myth of competitive capitalism and, and, and exponential growth. Nothing in nature grows exponentially like they want their markets to grow and companies to grow. Nothing grows exponentially except cancer, right? And then it kills its host. You know, and, and competitiveness is being justified as some other condition of nature, as this natural way that evolution happens. And it's not. Evolution is itself a team sport. I was taught in school badly in my in my nature and science classes that, you know, big trees, you know, the trees compete in the forest and the big trees crowd out the little trees and then the little trees die in the shade. And I read Secret Life of Trees and I find out, oh, no, it's not that at all. The trees are collaborating, that big trees that can get the sun are sending nutrients down through the soil, which also turns out to be alive, through the, the mycelia in the soil to the small trees. And the mushrooms actually take a service fee for the transfer. Then when the big trees, they lose their leaves in the, in the winter, the smaller trees, the evergreens, they send nutrients back 
to the big trees. So if human beings are the most advanced species, it's not because we're the most competitive, it's because we have the most advanced ways of actually of collaborating and communicating with each other. And language and writing and television and computers are all part of that collaborative uh, uh, energy. It's, it's, it, it's those are the things that we invent to foster better collaboration. The internet connected us in that way so we could facilitate more complicated exchanges. But at least we used to go online to do it because then it was a tool. But living online, living online, connected tech, it ended up really disconnecting us. And that's because it's substituting for rapport. It's substituting for our real life exchanges with one another. We don't need a substitute for real life. We need ways of compensating for distance, of compensating for my family member being sick, but we don't need a way to compensate for human connection. When we try to connect through these devices, as we know, you cannot establish rapport. You can't see if somebody's pupils are getting bigger or smaller, no matter how good your resolution is. You don't see if they're breathing with you or not as you connect. So the mirror neurons in your brain never fire. The oxytocin doesn't go through your blood. They said on the other side of the Skype call, they said they agreed with you, but you didn't feel it in your body. And what happens then? Do you blame the technology for that? You all, no, your body doesn't know from technology. Your body blames the other person and you stop trusting the other person. The more we use this, the more we try to connect digitally, the less it actually feeds that part of us, the less it, 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 the less it feeds our need for rapport. And then we tend to look to technology itself for that sense of connection and satisfaction. We do what's called mechanomorphism, where instead of, remember in the early days, we used to call it uh, anthropomorphism, when you put like rabbit ears on your Mac Classic and give it a name and stuff. Well, this is the opposite. Mechanomorphism is not seeing the human in your technology. It's seeing the technology, the computer, in the human being. And it's, again, it's that same reversal where now we are trying to get to be like machines instead of trying to get machines to be like us. When, when machines want to be like us, you know what they do to try to make AIs and things look more human? They add in randomness. As if that's the difference between humans and machines is that machines are logical and humans, well, there's this little extra bit of randomness. Now, what, what does that mean? That means that they understand human choice, novel behavior, they understand that as noise, right? That's noise, that's difference. It's like, uh, it's why we're taking all of our great performers and we're auto-tuning them to make them sound better. Now, does an auto-tune musician, an auto-tune vocalist, do they actually sound better? No, they sound more mechanical, right? Because what we're doing is filing off the weird human edges off the world. We're, we're filing them off ourselves. It's as if human anomalous behavior is, is the enemy of the predictability that we're looking to put into the market. So we start looking at human beings mechanically. We look at human beings in terms of our utility value. And this isn't the first time we've done that. We've done that throughout history. You know, Pharaoh looked at his slaves with utility value. But when you're understanding humans in terms of utility value, you're so likely to reverse figure and ground. You know, I've, I've started teaching in the last four or five years I've been teaching and I'm watching as people really look to education for utility value. Kids come into college asking, what job can I get if I major in that subject? the principals of the, the high school in our neighborhood, they're meeting with the CEOs of corporations to find out what skills do those corporations want from the kids and the workers of tomorrow? Or do you want us to teach the kids Excel or should they be learning blockchain or should they be learning this? As if the purpose of public education was to externalize the cost of job training for corporations. That's not what education was about. Public education was started really as compensation for a life of work. It was so that the coal miner could come home after a long day in the mines and be able to open a novel and understand what it says or read the newspaper and participate, you know, with dignity in the democratic process. You know, to, to make it an extension of work is the opposite, right? It becomes an extension, just one more piece of work. So what I'm asking that we do is to remember 
and retrieve human values. And in order to do that, and this is the dangerous part, I guess, is in order to do that for real, I've had to accept that human beings have some kind of essential dignity, that human beings are worth something even if we create no value, even with no data, even with no cash, that the human being has some intrinsic dignity, or dare we say it, has a soul, that human beings come in with souls. If you don't believe in souls, okay, at least soul, right? That there's soul, <laughs> that there's something going on here. And you find that. You can find that in the arts. You can find that when you establish rapport with another person. When you just sit with another person and breathe with a person, that, as Luke said, that's conspiracy, literally. To conspire means to breathe with somebody. That's the greatest conspiracy you can you can enact in a digital age, in a mechanomorphic time, when we're they're, they're trying to make us more predictable. We can become tech literate and media literate, at least enough to know, what is this thing doing to me? How do I feel when I am on this platform or that platform? We can I mean, we all know the, the drill. We can reestablish the commons and start uh, building apps that are that are uh, platform cooperatives rather than owned by uh, single corporations. We can start remembering that our our entire spiritual system, our our way of looking at the world, is really uh, dominated by a very uh, linear uh, uh, messianic quest towards some solution, some endpoint. I did a lot of work on this for for this little for this little book. I was looking at the uh, sort of pre-Judeo-Christian religions and what did they share versus what happened with the Judeo-Christian lineage and the the indigenous people. Most of them, their religions had very circular value systems. There wasn't this sense of of next year versus last year. It was just the the seasons came and went. Anything you did was going to come back. You you were going to reincarnate. So you can't just screw over somebody today because you're going to see them again if not tomorrow, you're going to see them in the next in the next life. The 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 beauty of the Judeo-Christian line and this is because we invented writing. We invited invented scripture so we could write down the history that we experienced and we could create contracts into the future. Writing gave us linear time. And once we had linear time, in a positive way, we decided, well, now we can have progress. We can make next year better than this year and this year better than last year. That was a beautiful thing. We're going to move forward. We're going to go. But what else happened is we got addicted to this notion of progress, of looking forward, particularly in America. You know, we have all of these great movies about robot slaves coming and getting us, but we don't want to remember two or three generations back when we had slavery. It's as if we're we're happy to think about it as long as it's in the future, but we can't think about any kind of repair or, or, or what we just did. And that's the same problem that these billionaires are having. They want to basically create a car that can drive fast enough that they don't have to smell their own exhaust. You know, but you can't get away. Eventually you're gonna come back around on the other side and you're gonna and you're gonna find it. You know, the the I mean I guess in conclusion here I used to be the guy. I mean, and I came to South by in, in 95 or 96, one of the first ones. I was the guy that people turned to, to to find out about the digital future. And now I feel like I'm the guy who's one of the last people who remembers what it was like before to tell us about the analog past. And I'm not arguing that we go back. You know, the Wall Street Journal said that I want to go back to the medieval times. No, no, no. I'm not asking that we go back to medieval times, but that we retrieve and bring forward many of the values that we left behind there. And that's when we left them behind, actually. The digital really does retrieve the medieval. That's why we see Burning Man and craft beers and Etsy and all this sort of handmade stuff. It's, it's, and the commons, I mean, think, and, and local currency. These are all uh, medieval things that were, that were repressed by, by the Renaissance and centrality. But we, we, when we retrieve the past, it's another way of saying, you know, let's respect the elders. Let, let's not build a nuclear power plant below the line where the where our where our ancestors put rocks and said please don't build anything below this point bad shit's going to happen but we go and build fukushima there i mean come on we're barreling ahead with no memory as if none of that matters we're just in 2.0 
And I think what we can do is retrieve those values and embed them in the future. I mean, and we see these values all over the place. The 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 city state coming back and the 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 illusion of the nation state, the platform cooperative movement, um, the 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 way we now understand that we're not going to stop memes with some new filter, but we're going to have to build cultural resilience, a kind of cultural immune response to these crazy uh, to these crazy messages. Uh, you know, every every semester, the first day of school, I get more notes from students who, who there are notes signed by their doctor that says, you know, please excuse Johnny from uh, class participation or presentations because he's got uh, uh, an anxiety disorder that doesn't allow him to stand in front of people. I mean, we're coming to a recognition that our schools can't just be places where we stick iPads in front of kids' faces, but a, a place where they can learn how to establish rapport and actually sit for 10 minutes with other people. We can begin to encourage weird, anomalous behavior. You know, we can start to just slowly be mindful of, of where we're at, of what we're feeling, of what's going on around us, of what we're contributing to. You know, the, the main directive of, uh, of Team Human, uh, of this book, is to find the others. And I mean that both in the in the traditional way, find the other people who think like this, who are ready to move on and, and be more human, but also find the other in the other, you know, find the human being in in that kid with the MAGA hat or in that Native American if you're on the MAGA side. You know, if 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 we can recognize the humanity in our, you know, political opponents, then and only then can we expect them to recognize the humanity in the immigrant that they might be afraid of. You know, hum human beings, human beings, we have the home field advantage on planet Earth, in the real world. You know, when we're out on the net, however cool it is, when we're out on the net, there's a whole lot of non-player characters. And these non-player characters, that's their their native territory. They're going to be more powerful. They're going to be more convincing. They're going to know they've got billions of dollars behind them to access our brainstem. You know, so we can use our technologies to find the others, but then we have to live and establish rapport right here in the real world with other people. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you to try just try it on anyway, using this figure and ground idea, this subject object as a litmus test for your decisions now, as you're developing a piece of technology to think, is this an expression of what you or someone actually wants or is this an effort to get them to submit? Is this bringing people together or pushing them apart? And I think that's not something that you even need to do with logic. That's something you can feel as you're developing it. You can feel that little nausea coming up. And the reason you can feel that is because you're human and alive. Right? So try to hold on to that humanity. Try to hold on to that aliveness, that presence as you're working. Don't give that up. And, uh, and then we may, uh, even just incrementally, uh, begin to move in, in, in directions that enhance and promote human community rather than so intentionally uh, undermine it. All right, and to that, to that end, Luke, let's um, use this, this next 15, 20 minutes to have some conversation with people. Well, first, let's give it up for Douglas Rushkoff. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you. Douglas, I, uh, I almost wish you could see yourself. You look like, uh, it looks like a 1984 Apple ad at the moment. I'm kind of expecting a woman to run up the aisle with a hammer and just throw it straight through the screen here. Um, we have Thanks. some time for questions. There are microphones in the audience. We have a couple of questions from Slido. And you guys do not hold back. The first question, Douglas, and uh, this is one of the members of the audience, they say you've been described as a disillusioned idealist. Corporations treat humans like children thrown to the Wall Street sharks. Will we ever outswim the sharks? We won't outswim the sharks on their territory. You know, but we can in the real world. That's, that's the beauty of it. You know, the, the, it's funny. When we first, and I say we, when, when the internet was first starting and we were first sort of homesteading on the digital frontier, 
it was as if this was a place for us to escape this kind of Reagan, Bush, young Republican, yuppie scum overculture, right? The internet was this weird little safe place for the counterculture, and then places like Austin seem like you know, cool, weird, slacker, Rick Linkletter places to be all internet-y and strange, like alt whatever Usenet group you were in. Then, around the time that AOL plugged the internet into this, into its, into itself, and the banks came online, it became this giant business place, this, this, this corporate sphere. But I feel like, in some ways, they've left behind the real world. I mean, they're trying to infect it now with. Um, you know, the, the uh, internet of things, you know, but you don't have to have a thing. I guess they're going to stick it on your, on your, you know, your gas meter, you know, no matter what you do. But the, the, the real world, I still feel is a place where we have, uh, where we have an advantage. So no, it's not, it's not even about out swimming the sharks. It's about realizing that corporations are not alive and the people in them are when 10,000 Google employees walk out because they don't want to make some, you know, piece of spyware or, or a, a, an evil browser for China. That's a sign that human autonomy is still functional. You know, and the other beauty of it is these companies are going to go out of business pretty soon anyway. I mean, th th I shouldn't. This is a whole other talk, I guess. But <laughs> all these. All these companies, all of their exit strategy is based in data. You know, they're all losing money, almost all of them, and they're all saying, when I go to meetings with them, oh yeah, but don't worry, look at all this data we're collecting. Well, if everybody's collecting all this data, the entire NASDAQ stock exchange is trying to base itself on data, and data is really a subset of marketing and advertising, and marketing and advertising has never taken up more than four or 5% of GDP, then this thing is pretty, is not going to be around so much longer unless they figure out something else. You know, you can't support everything with advertising. Something somewhere has to get sold for real. And you know, so um, in some ways, I'm I'm sanguine about about the future of this. We have a question just here. Hi, I've uh, been a fan of yours since my roommate brought home Generation X to our apartment on Alamo Square in the early 90s, so thank you. Um, I was speaking here yesterday about human touch as an antidote for loneliness, and mm. we're talking about connection, and it's something that's in our DNA, and I was wondering if it was something you considered while you were writing Team Human, Nurturing Human Touch. Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, the thing that I was trying to focus on are the, you know, the 500,000 years of mechanisms that we evolved for connection with one another. You know, eye contact, breathing in rapport, touching one another. Although, again, it's really interesting. Talking about touching is dangerous, too. Here's this white male talking about touching. Uh-oh. You know, I mean, who knows what I mean? Um, but, yeah, you know, it's scary. But... But uh, uh, no touch, uh, uh, th and the the way that the touch has been, uh, you know, kind of systematically uh, 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 removed from our our social lives is is a little scary. Well, touch got abused, right? Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm into anything that people can do in what we used to call, you know, meat space. Uh, it's so it's it's such a luxury at this point to be with other people and a real thing to touch. I mean, mm -hmm. it's one of the great reasons to have kids is you've got, you know, humans climbing up. all over you, you know? Your kids grow up though and then you don't have that anymore. I know, and they don't let you hug them anymore. <laughs> it's, but Thank you. No, but touch, touch is definitely, I mean, boy, if you ever want to reset, if you're gone, if you're, I mean, you have to think of all of these negative digital experiences, whether individually or collectively, they're all just bad trips. That's all they are, right? Your mind's been pulled down some, some weird, uh, some weird uh, feedback loop pathway. And the way to break that feedback loop as quickly as possible, right. If you get touched by someone, boom. I mean, you're out. You're, 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 you're present again. Thank you. Question just here. Yeah. Um, 
I've been working in technology for a while and feel so weird about it, and your book and your, your ideas speak so deeply to, to something that I've, I've felt for a long time. And I, I'm just wondering, uh, are there tools, like, like in this future you're describing, can you, is there a, a, a path that you suggest that we you know, start to explore to get there? Like, are there, I, I know that you talk about you know, different ways that you can start companies. Uh, there's the difference between Wikipedia and Facebook is pretty big, but um, can you kind of talk to, to how you see us creating this future? I mean, yeah, but there are such a multiplicity of solutions. Right, that, that I would hate to provide a, a kind of an industrial age style, one size fits all path. Like, oh, organize your business as a platform co-op, or oh, go do a B Corp, or oh, do a this. You know, and I think that if we can change or uh, uh, restore our inner sensibilities, you know, the, the, the way we form our picture of the world, um, that that's, the sort of more primal place to start from. So one is narratives. You know, we, we, we have to get ourselves off the idea of needing a, conclu a concluding narrative. I'm gonna do this till it's done. I'm gonna finish this. You know, there is no done. I, I prefer the Dungeons and Dragons style of story where you, you know, it's an infinite game and the object of the game is to keep the game going, not to win the game or the litmus test I was talking about before on is this um, uh, an expression of humanity or is it trying to shut down humanity in every single one of our choices. And if we start thinking about it that way, is this bringing people together or is it isolating people? Is this, uh, 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 I mean, is this bringing mindfulness or is this a mindfulness app that's just trying to addict people to a new subscription? You know, am I helping people find themselves or am I uh, uh, doing something else? So it's more, it sort of more comes uh, from there. You know, for me, and this is just speaking personally, so I'm an independent, right? I'm an author and a writer and this. Um, for me, it has to do with realizing that I don't have to operate at scale in order to be successful. You know, I was raised in a mindset, well, you can be a writer as long as everybody knows who you are. You can be a doctor as long as you're the best doctor that there is. You know, and, and, and I'm just as guilty of anyone of wanting a high Amazon rank or, you know, lots of people to know or get a bestseller. And um, what I'm realizing now is that's the booby prize. You know, that's the thing that I can chase forever and companies can chase it too. So I think the object of the game is to figure out how can I create a company that is allowed to reach a sustainable size? How can I uh, uh, create a life that doesn't require me to expand and to grow and to earn more and more and more? How do we get to that plateau? And you know, that will force sort of social, cultural decisions. How can you lead a life how could you even imagine a life where you don't need to earn enough money by the time you're 70 to then keep yourself alive until you're potentially 95? You know, what other creature tries to store up enough nuts to live out the last third of its life without any value creation? You know, and that's because we isolate old people from young people and, you know, they have to go, go into their separate retirement communities. It's, it's, it was great for business, but bad for us. So I guess I'm looking at... Uh, uh, I think we get the greatest variety of solutions if we do it individually, kind of from more of a place of, of coherence than uh, listening to, you know, one New York media theorist's, uh, you know, kind of business, business answers. Let's take another question from this side. Hi, uh, this is really amazing. Thank you. Thank what's you. your oh? What's your feeling? I'm not going to say this right. I'm sure there's a term, but embedded technology when technology goes into our body, like implants and stuff. Yeah. If you want it, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's funny. It depends. I mean, there's some folks who convincingly talk about. You know, they're going to implant a little thing that will vibrate right near their heart whenever they're facing north. 
And they believe that that compass will in, will restore their biological, intuitive sense of direction, that they're kind of a re, retraining themselves. Um, and, you know, as medicine, I could see it. If somebody's always disoriented, you know, they get this app or something implanted to sort of help them do this thing. But I would almost want people to only do it because they're sick and need to get like normal, right? They're blind, so you can implant these things and they can see. Just like I'm using Skype now, not because I wanna to talk to you by Skype, but because I couldn't get there, because there's an illness. So for that, or for pure fun, right? I would rather someone grow a digital tail than grow another arm. Do you know what I mean? So, because I, I don't want to give the market another excuse to enforce my understanding of myself as not having enough utility value. I have enough utility value just like this, and I don't need to do anything to myself to be more useful, you know, to society. We're in a jobless reality anyway, right, supposedly. They don't have enough jobs for us anyway. So why get more skills just to be jobless with more arms and, you know, and things? But certainly for people who, who are ill, to get them able to function and be with the rest of us, that's a great thing. Or, psycho, you know, a lot of people have used um, various technologies to help them, you know, uh, cope and to, to become more social. You know, there's the, I forgot his name now, the, the most connected man alive. You know, he talks about how he was suicidally depressed and now, you know, he can be with other people and all because he retrained himself with things. So for that, yeah, otherwise, um, let's do it for let's do it for its own sake. Let's do it for art's sake, for people who want to play that way, but um, not not out of uh, uh, economic need. So, Douglas, finally, how do the audience here join Team Human? Well, I mean, it's interesting. Some people want to come join. They like email me. How do I join? What do I do? And like, it, I almost mean Team Human facetiously. Like, just join the human race. You know, you know, stand up for being, it's like humans are okay. And all you have to do to be on Team Human is to decide it's okay and you like being human and you want humans to survive and, and do well. Um, you could certainly buy the book. Um, uh, and if you buy it at South By, I, I, I was supposed to do a book signing, what, from, from three to four, I think. Is it three to four your time? Yeah. Or two, two to, to three. three? Two to three. So if, if you get the book there, um, Luke's going to take your address and I'll send you a little book plate to put in your book. You know, I'll personalize a, a thing for you to put in there because um, I'm sorry I'm not there live. But it'll be more highly personalized than it might I might have had time to do in the booth. Um, and there's a Team Human podcast that you can listen to, um, which is a, a really fun thing. I mean, I'm trying to kind of flip my career at this point from being about me to being about the people, other people. And I really see, I mean, I don't know if I'll live true to it, but I see Team Human, the book, as kind of a mic drop. That it's like, it's not a book that's about something, it's a book that's meant as this experience for people to go through. Um, it's like a little, you know, a hundred little, uh, uh, almost meditations on, on what's happened. Um, it's more of a manifesto. Um, but then, you know, so now I've got a podcast and it's about using the platform I've created to give voice to other people, you know, or teaching at CUNY or, or, or anywhere to teach, to try to, um, uh, you know, again, interact with more people to, to, uh, to. Wow. More than enough, uh, more than enough for any one lifetime. And there's, there's other things, there's other people, there's other voices, um, that, that need to be heard. So if I can uh, become a, uh, uh, a, a filter and an amplifier for, for those people, um, that'd be great. So Team Human, you can join that. I mean, you can support that and get, we have little membership cards just to help people remember that they're members of the human race. Um, but yeah, but to join is really to stand up for human rights and to stand up for human rights in the meeting. That's the hardest time to do it. They're developing some new app or some new thing and you're at an ad agency, you're out of this. And to question the underlying assumptions of those decisions when you're at a meeting and say, well, wait a minute, how is this serving our users? How is this really serving them? Um, 
sometimes it is contagious and people start looking at, oh, right, remember when we made technology because it was going to actually help people do stuff? Um, that'd be so cool to explore again. Um, and and it, it is contagious. And I've, I've started to see a lot of people in companies start to think start to think that way. They don't know how, right? They need to reorient. They need to, 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 to be able to think that way and make those kinds of decisions. You almost need to have some real social fabric in your life. So you recognize uh, rapport, you recognize solidarity and connection. But once you do, it becomes really easy to extend through our work, through our technologies, and through pretty much everything we do. So please join me in thanking the very human Douglas Rushkoff. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. I'll see you all soon.